um, being able to get on, we sometimes have a challenge getting ourselves logged on to these meetings, but we have everybody here, so we appreciate that. Uh, remember, if you would, please, to silence your phone so that um, we're um, not interrupted. And if you have, um, if you think you may have background noise, please mute your um, computer so that uh, we don't have that. Um, I'm Rosemary Altman, Chairman of the Mississippi Board of Education, and I am present in Clinton, Mississippi. Uh, this meeting of the Board of Education is being held today, Tuesday, April 15th, 2021, at 10 a.m. via teleconference and video means pursuant to the Mississippi Code Annotated uh, Section 2541.5. Notice of this meeting was posted in accordance with state law and included the date, time, the place, and the purpose of the meeting and identified the location of the meeting available to the public. An audio recording is being made of this meeting and minutes of the meeting will be record, recorded and the meeting is also being live streamed. Uh, Dr. Kerry Wright is present uh, in Madison, Mississippi to uh, participate in the teleconference meeting. Um, as I call the names of the board members, please state the location of your presence for the meeting so we can declare a uh, quorum. Uh, Dr. Angela Bass. Present in Jackson, Mississippi. Okay. Mr. Glenn East. Present, Gulfport, Mississippi. Dr. Karen Elam. Present, Oxford, Mississippi. Dr. Ronnie McGee. Uh, he's on. I wonder if he's muted. Yes, he's muted. Okay. Dr. McGee. Dr. McGee? Uh, I'm, I'm here now. Okay. <laughs> Ronnie McGee, present. Okay. Uh, Mr. Omar Jamil? Present, Hernando, Mississippi. And Ms. Amy Zane? Present in Columbus, Mississippi. Okay, good. A quorum of the board is present at the location stated for the purpose of conducting the meeting through teleconference and video means. This April 15th, 2021 board meeting is now called to order at uh, 10.05 a.m. And since this is a teleconference meeting, please identify yourself when asking questions, making comments, or making uh, motions. Uh, we will have our Pledge of Allegiance and our uh, invocation. Uh, uh, Dr. Karen Elam will lead our pledge and Dr. Ronnie McGee, he will uh, offer our prayer. So we ask that you join us, please. Please stand. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, of the United, United States, States of, America. of America and, and to, to the republic, republic for which for we which stand, stand, one nation, nation under, under God, God indivisible, with, with liberty, liberty and, and justice, justice for, all. for all. Dr. McGee? Yes. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we come to you today asking for your guidance wisdom and discernment of the items placed before us. Help us to engage in meaningful discussion and collective consideration of the information presented to us as a board. Guide us through conversations as we decide the best pathways to move forward with policies that will improve our students' possibilities for success in life. Help us to grow closer as a group and nurture the bonds of community to foster positive educational outcomes in our schools across our state. Make your vision clear to us. Show us the corridor to improve for our students to become successful, productive members of our communities and state. Fill us with the same grace and mercy to show to us, O oh Lord, as you guide us to make the decisions that will impact the students, faculty, staff, and communities now and in the future. Continue to remind us that we do here today all we accomplish will be in pursuit of your truth, service to our fellow humans, but most importantly, pleasing to you and your glory. We ask these things we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Our first item for action is approval of the minutes of March 11th, 2021 board meeting. Do I have a motion to approve those minutes as presented? So moved. So moved, Karen. Okay, uh, Dr. Okay. Elam uh, and Dr. McGee. Dr. Elam made the motion. Dr. McGee seconded. All in favor? 
Aye. Aye. Okay, any opposed? All right, the motion of the uh, minutes are approved. Are there any other um, additions or deletions to the agenda for today? If so, I'll entertain a motion to do so now. All right, hearing none, the agenda will stand. Are there any items on the consent agenda that uh, members would like to pull out for discussion? All right, hearing none, we'll move on to the report of the state superintendent, Dr. Wright. Yes, thank you. Um, I do want to apologize that we've had to have this meeting. That Dr. Wright, before we have to actually move to approve the agenda. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's okay. Sorry, okay. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's okay. I should have done that. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the agenda as presented? So move, Karen Elam. Okay. And a second? Do second. we have a second? Okay. Second. My name is All right. Good. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? All right, thank you then. All right, Dr. Wright, sorry for that thank interruption. Oh, no, no problem. Um, I just wanted to say I want to apologize that we are not in the building. Uh, we are having a ton of renovation done on all floors. And if you've been in the building lately, it's covered in plastic and there is dust and a mess everywhere you walk. So we're hoping that DFA will get this completed um, so that we can meet in the building on, uh, on for our May meeting, but know that we're at DFA's mercy uh, as to how fast uh, the renovations um, get completed. So um, thank you for your patience. Um, since we met last, um, I've had several presentations that I've given. Uh, I was a member of a, uh, Equity Talks. It's an ongoing uh um, program around equity, and this one happened to be around women uh, in terms of educational leaders. And so I was on a panel with um, two other um, education leaders across our nation. I also did a keynote for the CCSSO uh, Legislative Conference. Um, I did a presentation at the Education Achievement Council. It was an update on Mississippi Connects so that they knew exactly what the status of our initiative was. Um, I had an invitation to attend the Northeast Regional Principals Meeting, and I did that and provided updates to, to them. Uh, I was also on Politico. Uh, their focus was on recovery and what are states and districts doing in terms of recovery and getting children uh, back in school. And then um, an interesting one, uh, the Education Funder Strategy Group. This is a group of national funders, national foundations, and they'd asked uh, me to come and talk about how can the field leverage the moment and then how can philanthropy help. So uh, it was a good chance to, to get in front of folks that, um, that do fund a lot of things around the nation uh, where education is concerned. And certainly last but not least, Pete and I were on Paul Gallo um, and uh, talked about just a variety of things uh, with him. Uh, several meetings have taken place. Um, Chiefs for Change Executive Board meeting uh, was held. I've also held meetings with my superintendent's advisory, my principal's advisory, and my student advisory um, committees, which is always great. And we also then had a uh, two-day meeting with our technical advisory um, committee. And that's the group that we were discussing uh, our accountability and how to measure accountability. Uh, they're the ones that really kind of weigh in. Uh, all the tax around the nation are struggling with the exact same thing because nobody administered statewide assessments last year. So uh, we're now trying to figure out because the federal government is still requiring us at this point to measure accountability in some way. So we need their guidance on how to do that, that make sure that it's reliable and valid um, in order to do so. And I wanted you to have an update today on, since the session is over and the budget has been finalized, I've asked Dr. Gavin to give the board an update on how the um, department uh, was impacted and also uh, how funds were appropriated because uh, we've had some exciting news and I thought this would be a great chance for her to, to let you and obviously the world know uh, we've got a lot uh, a lot to be thankful for and so I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Gavin. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Wright. Uh, this legislative, legislative session was quite challenging, but in the end, uh, MDE, as far as our appropriation, we ended up overall really not bad in terms of our appropriations. We actually saw about a 2% increase in our non-specified items for our general fund. Um, 
Uh, we did receive a cut in our pens, so we're going to have to identify 16 pens that we're going to have to cut from the agency. Um, we also, the great news was we got additional funding for MSIS. Uh, after all these years and putting in the request year after year, we received uh, $7.6 million in uh, funding for MSIS. We got $5 million for math coaches this year. We got an additional $8 million in, from, uh, for our earn, early learning collaboratives. And we also received a million dollars for CTE equipment upgrade that we can actually put out an RFP to the districts. And that's something we've not seen in our appropriation bill uh, in several years. Uh, MAP um, actually saw a slight increase in funding. They did, uh, there's a whole harmless bill. So our, we were able to calculate MAP based on the 1920 ADA as opposed to the 2021. So that helped the districts. And I think there were six districts maybe that their ADA was actually higher in 2021 than 1920, but the bill allowed them to um, get the higher of those two years. So it was a great year for MAP. Also for our teachers, normally they have about $12 million in uh, school supply money. The legislature appropriated $20 million uh, for school supplies. So our teachers, instead of receiving $300 or so, they're actually going to be receiving probably close, closer to $600 per teacher to buy supplies for their classrooms. Um, some of the other items, uh, we did receive an additional million and a half for early learning coaches. Uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned, but we got $8 million for our early learning collaboratives. That's, that's a huge number for us. So we're pretty excited about how our funds um, were appropriated this year. We saw a slight increase in uh, CTE overall. I think they got an additional 700,000. And so as you remember this year, we also uh, went back to the legislature and had to get a deficit appropriation for this current year. So they made us whole for the upcoming year as well as an additional 730,000. So overall, our budget for 21-22, for the fiscal year 22, was, was very good. I can say the bottom line was we received about a 2% increase. I think we started out uh, with the challenge of what the elbow recommended was about a 34% increase. So uh, through peace work and all of that, we were able to cut that down to about a 2% increase. So we're very appreciative of the legislature um, seeing the work that was, has been going on in the agency and the funding us, uh, some of our initiatives that we have. Dr. Gavin, just a, a, a little word of clarity. <laughs> and a little <laughs> word that you used. Uh, we weren't looking at a 35% increase and we narrowed it down to 2%. I'm sorry, <laughs> decrease. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they weren't that generous. <laughs> about a 35% decrease over prior year. And so we were able to uh, see a 2% increase. Uh, so I think the state employees um, with the state personnel board, if they're doing a realignment, so we will have to absorb some of that 2% increase. Hopefully most of the state employees will be receiving a pay raise. So we do have a little money to be able to absorb that pay increase that will come to our state employees. And I think um, that pretty much sums it up. Thank you, Dr. Wright. Thanks, Dr. Gavin. We are excited. Um, this is a, a great opportunity uh, for us, uh, you know, to expand early childhood. The math coaches are a real plus. The superintendents and principals have been asking for that since they've seen the true value of our literacy coaches. And the other thing that we have is another line item in there. They carried over the line item. Uh, to allow um, districts um, to um, get, if they're paying it or what to repay for uh, work keys, exams, AP, IB, Cambridge, dual credit, dual enrollment. So there's another million dollar line item that we, they, they gave us again this year. So all in all, it's, it's great news for us um, and we're excited to get to work. Okay, does that include... Uh, Thank you. That was, a, that was a great report. Dr. Gavin gave that report to some of us a little earlier this morning. It was exciting. Um, my um, involvement has been other than a lot of phone calls and emails. Uh, I did uh, attend the Educational Achievement uh, Council virtually with Dr. Wright, where she gave an overview of the rollout of devices and 
all that went on with that and, and the other things that were going on in the department and that was very well received. Um, <clears throat> our student representatives now will give their report. We're gonna let um, Amy Zang go first. Amy, are you there and ready to give your report? Yes, ma'am, I am. Okay, all right, go ahead. All right, um, today I'll be talking about um, mental health and about how um, our social life is looking up despite COVID. So starting off with, with mental health, um, last month, I was on a student panel for the National Consortium of Secondary Science Schools' Mental Health Summit. Um, and I was on the panel with four other students we talked about a lot of topics, but the thing that stood out to me the most was how students are comfortable talking to other students um, and their peers about mental health, but they're also reluctant to go to adults for help. So the conclusion that we drew is that students um, aren't used to talking to administration and counselors, especially if there's no precedent for doing so. And that panel got me thinking about how to facilitate communication at my school, uh, which is MSMS. So right now I'm working with our student government and pushing for the formation of committees made up of student body representatives and to have a committee focus um, on mental health. The goal is for committees to understand the student body's thoughts on mental health and the changes they'd like to see with policies and things from administration um, and they will be finding that information through methods like interviewing students, sending out polls to the student body, and holding meetings. The committee will take that information while staying in contact with administration so they can bridge the gap and bring up student concerns in an easier and more thorough way. So this um, committee hasn't been approved yet, but if it does end up working out, I'll talk with Dr. Wright's Student Advisory Council on how to implement this in their schools as well. Um, and I'll talk with MSMS students on how to set this up at their home schools. And I'm really hopeful that these discussions about mental health um, will lead to change across the state. Next, I'd like to talk about um, student social life and what's coming up. So our lives are still going on despite um, COVID and MSMS's prom is happening in about two weeks. It'll be in person and follow social distancing. I know that a lot of other schools are also having prom this year or they've had it already. And that's very exciting for a lot of us. Um, and in other fun news, MSMS has sent out acceptance letters to rising juniors. And I'm really looking forward to meeting my juniors and helping them through their MSMS experience. Um, additionally, I'll be able to talk to them about the state of education in, in Mississippi and hear their perspectives or changes they'd like to see because, you know, it's a um, new class of people all around the state. And lastly, I'd like to thank Omar um, for helping me when I first joined the board as a student representative. He helped me learn how to be an um, effective student representative and I was kind of nervous when I first joined it, but having another student on the board really helped um, and it makes it a lot easier to speak up. So in summary, there are a lot of exciting things happening regarding mental health um, and our social lives are still happening. And Omar, I'm really grateful to have served with you this year and thank you for all the work that you've done. Thanks, Amy. Uh, you have really done a good job, and we look forward to you being the senior member next year, and uh, you can help bring a junior student along, just as Omar has done you. So uh, we hope you can have fun at your prom. <laughs> uh, Omar, are you there, and you ready to give your report? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, so this is my final report, obviously. Um, uh, it's kind of heartbreaking, but... <laughs> Uh, just, just bear with me. It's a little bit, it's a little bit long, but I kind of wanted to address as much as I could. Uh, for the past two years, I've been blessed with the opportunity to serve on the Mississippi Board of Education as an inaugural member of the journey to tra traverse. As I pave it, acting as a student representative for the state has provided as many triumphs as difficulties. In order to understand the financial liberties bestowed upon the board, 
as well as the procedures and policies capable of fruition within the boardroom, took a great deal of time and effort to understand. However, armed with patience and intuitive mentors, my ability, my ability to engage in progressive policies surged with every monthly meeting. It was in the first year of engagement with the board that Shelby and I learned the basics of board procedure, procedures and goals, of how we can create policies that will, that will raise our standardized testing scores, of how each and every district and region of Mississippi have distinct educational needs that only the state board can solve. Nevertheless, we persisted and Shelby and I improved our discourse in a manner that accurately and fluently reflected the needs of Mississippi students. Perhaps the greatest achievement of our time on the board has been the inclusion of Dr. Wright's Student Advisory Council. In the previous year, the council was much of a trial run. Student members had to learn secondhand about the engagement of the Student Bo State Board of Education in regards to Mississippi curriculum and policy implementation. It was difficult for Shelby and I to not only learn about the State Board of Education, but to also relay the information to our student council. This year is when it changed, however. It goes without saying that Amy has been fundamental in my improvement as a, as a board member. Her ability to engage with the council as well as the Board of Education surpassed my own capab capabilities in my first year. Amy has helped, helped to ensure that our student advisory council is always updated with information, important topics of, topics of discussion, and items for our student ag agenda. Providing ample opportunities for Zoom meetings, presentation discourse, and summit invitations, Amy assisted me when I was unavailable to lead. I'm confident in her personal conviction and community outreach, and I believe she'll be leave as profound an impact on the Board of Education as I have. I stepped down from my position with relief, knowledgeable that another leader is assuming the reins. It is with great sadness, however, that I, that I depart from the Board of Education. I've grown familiar to the cordiality of the boardroom, the familiar banter of board members, and even the corner table I called my own. I've said as many farewells to board members as I have greeted new ones. Yet I leave knowing I have fulfilled my duty as best as I could and the future student board member involvement is guaranteed under a welcoming administration. Before I end my final report, I would like to address some personal improvements I see fit for the Board of Education. I encourage more dialogue opportunities between our teacher and student advisory councils in order to foster improved awareness of both similar and contrasting issues in the school environment. I also, I also ask the state board to implement student advisory councils in every district, both to serve as a pipeline to statewide issues addressed with the Mississippi Student Advisory Council and to create solutions to district specific issues. Overall, I ask the State Board of Education to implement policies that network our student council members with similarly engaged teachers and administrators. With that being said, I conclude my final report. Well, thank you, Omar. Uh, for those of you who may not know, uh, Omar and Shelby Dean, who is complete, completing her freshman year at Mississippi College, were our first two uh, student representatives, and they were just sort of thrown out there uh, into a world that they were not familiar, uh, and into all these acronyms and policies and what have you that uh, come naturally to a lot of people. And so you have done a yeoman's job in being able to navigate those waters and lay the groundwork. And, and um, you and Amy together have worked beautifully this year to move us to the next level and engage students statewide and uh, be able to get their input through the superintendent's um, student advisory uh, council. And I hope this has been a good experience for you, but I also hope that as time goes on, you can look back and know that you uh, helped um, get this off the ground, that you help lay the groundwork for other students. And I, and I hope you'll take pride in that. Uh, we can't let you go without a resolution and the whereas is and the therefore. So just uh, listen carefully. Whereas the Mississippi State Board of Education selected Mr. Omar Jamil through a competitive pro process as the first junior student representative to the board, to serve a two-year term from July uh, 2019 to April 2021. And whereas Mr. Jamil or Hernando exemplified educational excellence in the DeSoto County School District by maintaining a 4-0 grade point average in high school and by earning a 34 on the ACT and by challenging himself through numerous advanced placement and high school honor courses. He is currently a National Merit Finalist and a U.S. Presidential Scholar Candidate. And whereas Mr. Jamil further enhanced his academic career by participating in summer studies at Stanford University, Harvard University, and the U.S. Naval Academy. 
He also participated in Duke talent programs at Rice University in Houston, Texas, and Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas. And whereas Mr. Jamil became active in several student and community organizations, including the National Honor Society, Mu Alpha Theta, Future Business Leaders of America, and stage and performing arts activities. He has been a member of the student council since the eighth grade and most recently served as executive president. He was selected for the prestigious DeSoto County High School Hall of Fame and the Delta Council Scholars. And he also served on the state superintendent student advisory council, helping to lead discussions with his peers from around the state on improving educational opportunities for students. And whereas Mr. Jamil earned several awards for chess, school spelling, bees, and school knowledge bowl teams, he also participated in community soccer and baseball, and his scavenger hunt team for the Hernando Citywide Scavenger Hunt has placed first five years in a row. Whereas Mr. Jamil plans to continue his education and major in political science, and whereas Mr. Jamil has brought his experiences as a student in the classroom and commitment to his role on the Mississippi State Board of Education to make sure that Mississippi's public schools are always improving and children receive the education they deserve. Therefore, be it resolved that on this day, the 15th day of April, 2021, the Mississippi State Board of Education recognizes Mr. Omar Jamil for his contributions to the Mississippi State Board of Education and to the advancement of education in the state of Mississippi. So uh, we will all sign this and you will get an official copy of this to put in your scrapbook, Omar. And uh, <clears throat> I didn't mention where Omar plans to go to school because he's still looking at his options, but I understand Vanderbilt and Washington University are two of his considerations, but I feel sure Omar will go to school wherever he wants to go to school because your background is so very good. And we're very proud of you. We're very happy to have had you with us. And uh, we're going to miss you. And we're going to, we certainly will be following you. And we want you to stay in touch with us because we feel like um, you're going to be a bright star out of Mississippi. And we certainly want to follow you in your journey. Uh, anyone else have any comments for Omar? Well, I just want to ditto, obviously, everything you just said, but to really, Omar, thank you so much for the leadership that you gave to the inaugural uh, Superintendent Student Advisory Council. I have enjoyed every single minute with um, that group of children, and they're amazing, and uh, I really think that you've really done a lot, you and Amy both, and uh, Shelby, when she was here, um, to really... Um, make sure that they were doing something very fruitful. I mean, I think that you you witnessed all the presentations that they just did a month ago, and they put a lot of time and energy into that. And I think that your leadership um, and Amy's and Shelby's have made a big difference. And so uh, I wish you absolutely nothing but the best. Um, I know that you're going to be uh, what I call one of those wonderful above the fold articles. Uh, <laughs> that we, can, we can monitor uh, your progress and your success um, as you move forward. So. Congratulations and best wishes to everything that you do. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes. This is Dr. Bass. I also want to yeah. say uh, congratulations to both Omar and Amy. Um, I'm realizing now that um, I'm, I didn't have, uh, I, I may have, should have brought this up earlier, but there, um, I do have a subcommittee report um, related to the student representatives, and I can hold off until we get to other business, or I can make that report. Well, we're going to do subcommittee reports in just a second. So, okay. uh, I mean, that's our next item. Uh, so, yeah, you you have good news. So, we'll okay, uh, great. Yeah, we'll call on you in just a minute. Uh, we'll move now into subcommittee uh, reports. The first one on the agenda is the legislative committee. And we met earlier today and um, Pete Smith brought us up to date on all the actions that were taken uh, related to educational issues in the uh, recent uh, legislative session. So Pete, if you're available, uh, if you're there, would you um, give us an update of the highlights of that session, please? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and, and the rest of the board. Um, to um, first of all, I want to thank uh, uh, 
uh, both the uh, education chairs, uh, Richard Bennett in the House, as well as Dennis DeBar in the Senate, and then the two uh, appropriations chairs, John Reed in the House, as well as Briggs Hobson uh, in the Senate for uh, really working uh, shoulder to shoulder with us this year uh, on our budget, as Dr. Gavin has explained to you, as well as on some, on, on some very important uh, <coughs> A legislation uh, that they passed uh, for education this year. They didn't want to do a whole lot, uh, which we're always thankful that we don't get 20 plus bills um, out of committees. However, uh, there were about 10 to 15 bills passed. I'll highlight a couple of them uh, for you. Most of these bills have already been signed into law uh, by Governor Reeves. Uh, there's still a few uh, pending uh, to be signed, one being the K-12 appropriations bill. I think it's due back on, the, uh, on Monday the 19th. So uh, just a couple of pieces of legislation to highlight uh, uh, for the public, as you are aware that House Bill 60, uh, 633 was a computer science bill, uh, which finally passed, was brought up last year, um, didn't quite make it, uh, but uh, brought up this year and made it. Uh, but always wanna remind uh, the public that, you know, the Department of Education had an uh, initiative some five to three to four years ago uh, by implementing computer science K-12 by 2024 and was well on its way to doing that without any funding. So happy to say that during uh, this legislative session, not only did we get a, a bill, but uh, the Ceasefire Foundation uh, is going to donate a million dollars toward the effort of professional development and curriculum, as well as the legislature appropriated a million dollars. So we'll have $2 million going uh, toward this effort uh, for computer science implementation. Uh, one critical being is the professional development and curricular, curriculum development uh, for our teachers uh, to be able to uh, implement. So that's uh, pretty exciting. Um, House Bill 852 uh, was the uh, teacher pay raise bill Dr. Gavin mentioned, uh, 50, almost $52 million uh, for the pay raise this year. Zero to two year teachers will see an increase uh, of $1,100 to get their starting salaries up to $37,000. And then all the other uh, teachers will receive a $1,000 pay raise. And then you'll have, again, uh, assistant teachers receiving a, a $1,000 uh, raise, uh, which is uh, over the last couple of conversations regarding uh, teacher pay raises, the assistants have been right there and uh, benefiting from it. Uh, and, and again, I, I think this is probably the fifth or so pay raise that the legislature has uh, given teachers over the past say, eight, eight, eight or so years. Uh, House Bill 1047, which is uh, a bill that dealt with national board certification. In that piece of funding that we get from the legislature, it allows for nurses as well as certified speech language uh, therapists to receive an additional $6,000 stipend uh, if they are certified in their areas. And um, the legislature put a cap on the number of nurses and speech pathologists. Um, and this year, this bill removed that cap. The cap uh, was in place based on law. However, the uh, funding has always been there to fund the remaining um, nurses and speech pathologists that were uh, on the waiting list, if you will. So now they'll be added. Um, to that list, and then they also added uh, athletic trainers. Uh, we were told there are about 10 or 11 athletic trainers across the state, and they will also be uh, qualified for uh, the $6,000 per year stipend. Uh, there's a lot of work done around uh, teacher incentives and scholarships as it relates to um, uh, programs that are being administered out of the uh, IHL and the uh, Student Financial Services Department. Um, they created the William Winter Jack Reed uh, Teacher Loan Repayment Program, and what this has done is basically consolidated a lot of incentive programs, probably deleted some. There were a lot on the books that were either not funded in a while or, you know, just barely funded. And so uh, they're making a concerted effort to try to streamline a lot of these uh, incentive scholarships for uh, teachers, uh, particularly going into uh, hard to um, geographically shortage areas. And so we're looking forward to that. This year, the um, legislature appropriated $2 million uh, to get that program up and running and uh, hope to do more in the coming years. On the Senate side, uh, Dr. Gavin did mention Senate Bill 21, 
49, which is the whole harmless bill where uh, districts were able, were able to uh, calculate MAD funding based on the 1920 pre-pandemic, if you will, uh, ADA versus the 2021. And uh, again, saw about six districts uh, during that pandemic year uh, increase their ADA. So they'll also uh, receive uh, funding based on their higher amount. Uh, 2267 was a reciprocity bill that basically saw the legislature remove any minimum standards for teachers who come uh, to our state with a valid uh, teacher's license, offer them reciprocity. Uh, pending uh, a job by districts, pending a background check uh, that comes back favorably. Uh, and last but not least, um, Dr. Gavin mentioned to you about uh, you know, the funding that we received this year, particularly for uh, finally receiving funding for a lot of priorities of the board, uh, including MSIS uh, and, and the like. Uh, what people may not know is that uh, when the lottery bill passed a couple of years ago, the first $80 million of revenue from the lottery will go to throughout the state to improve infrastructure, roads, bridges, and the like. But anything, any funding above or revenue above 20 or $80 million uh, will come to uh, education, will go to education. And this year, education uh, received roughly $30 million from lottery proceeds uh, because the revenues hit above $80 million. And so uh, expanding early childhood education, receiving money from MC, uh, for MSIS, math coaches, literacy coaches, and a couple of other items, that's where those, uh, that's why, where those fundings kind of, uh, came from, was the uh, revenue of the lottery. And so the legislature, uh, to their credit, was very cautious about um, expending those funds this year because this, this market, as you know, could be very volatile. This year we hit eight, uh, 30 million next year may be less, or it could even be more. So uh, they wanted to be sure that they funded things that the, the regular state budget could continue to fund uh, in the absence that the lottery uh, proceeds dip. So uh, again, I wanted to you know, basically thank uh, the, the, the chairman of, of the Appropriations and Education and, and virtually working with the House and the Senate uh, this year. We had a, a, a great year. I hope to continue to have an even better year uh, next year. So. That concludes uh, my report. All right, thank you. I think uh, it's important to point out too that the money that's coming from the lottery uh, and being used for uh, math coaches and early child uh, early childhood collaboratives and whatever that money is going directly into school di districts or into things that directly impact school districts, not being absorbed somewhere in the department. Um, but it's being used out in the field. So thank you, Pete. We appreciate your hard work. We're glad you um, uh, are over there representing us and working hard for us. So <laughs> we appreciate it. Um, Dr. Bass, now you can share your good news. Thank you. And I apologize. I didn't see it on the... No, that's okay. It's good performance <laughs> and accountability subcommittee. Go ahead. Okay. So um, for the school performance and accountability subcommittee, we had um, a meeting of the ad hoc screening committee to begin the process of reviewing the applications for the new student representative that will be serving from 2021 to 2023. And so this student will be a high, a high school junior student. Um, and there were 73 applications that met all the requirements that we um, evaluated. And I also had the opportunity to serve on the ad hoc screening committee. And I will say that there are some very talented um, and really gifted students in our state. And so it was a really fulfilling experience for me. We have identified uh, the top 10 semifinalists. Um, and I'm going to announce their names now in their school district and their school. The first is Ms. Kale Amos from Rankin County School District, um, and she attends Brandon High School. Ms. Amanata Ba, who attends DeSoto County, DeSoto Central High School in DeSoto County. Ms. Carrie McKenzie Bivens, who attends Houston High School in Houston School District. 
Mr. Joshua Bowman, who attends Northwest Rankin High School in Rankin County School District. Miss Alexis Chen, who attends Center Hill High School in DeSoto County School District. Miss Madison Duvall, who attends Northwest Rankin High School in Rankin County. Miss Micah Hill, who attends Laurel High School in the Laurel School District. Miss Kirtan Karthikian, who attends Oxford, who, can, who attends Oxford High School in the Oxford School District. Miss Isabella Reynolds, who attends Pascagoula High School in Pascagoula Gaucher School District. And Miss Ella Watts, who attends Columbia High School in the Columbia School District. And so we just want to congratulate those 10 semifinalists. The competition was really steep. Um, and these students really demonstrated that they all have um, what it takes to serve on the, on the uh, State Board of Education. The next steps will be that the 10 semifinalists will be interviewed by the School Performance and Accountability Subcommittee in May. Um, and then the subcommittee will recommend no more than four finalists to the State Board for an interview in June. Thank okay, you. thank you. That uh, That is a challenging job that ad hoc committee's just gone through, and especially with 73 applicants. So we appreciate your leading that effort and uh, getting us to 10 names. And, and uh, the most exciting thing is to see the numbers grow, the number of applicants uh, grow. And uh, that's a testament, I think, to uh, Omar and Amy talking about uh, their experience and the Student Advisory Committee and superintendents who um, and administrators who are now paying attention and see the value of it. So thank you for that that report. We look forward to interviews and, and bringing forward some candidates. Uh, Dr. Elam, your educator quality subcommittee mm -hmm. meeting. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, first, to start off with, Yes, we did meet yesterday, and uh, I wanted to introduce the remaining board members, not introduce them to you, but to give them recognition that they're going to be serving on this committee, um, Dr. Bass and Dr. McGee. Um, I more than welcome them to the committee since we were a committee of one uh, and, uh, and uh, struggling along. So I'm very appreciative that they are both willing to serve. Um, Dr. Uh, Murphy, the director of the executive director, I don't know which, of the uh, teaching, uh, teaching and leading uh, division, um, set put, put together a very effective short agenda for us in which each of his uh, direct reports and the divisions within his operation gave an overview of their um, uh, function and uh, responsibilities. And that was very interesting, and I think very worthwhile. Um, the most important piece that came up is that we are going to be, of course, looking at it today, but that is the um, new document that we're asking go forward to uh, begin the APA process of the EPP's um, process and guidelines. Um, Dr. Burson, I believe, will be leading that discussion when we get to that item on our agenda, but I ask that um, board members pay particularly strong attention to this. It's very important, and a great deal of work has gone into preparing it to bring it forward to you. So with that, I will. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, and our last committee, uh, subcommittee that met was the Academic Achievement and Pre-K Early Childhood Committee, and Mr. East is going to give that report. Thank you, ma'am. I also will let you know that uh, Ms. Altman and Ms. Elam are on that committee as well. We heard an outstanding report yesterday from uh, the directors that are responsible for a lot of work at our state. Uh, Walter really praised their work that we listened to yesterday concerning their desire to get to the, the parents in our, in, our, in our state, get to the teachers in our state uh, with all of the, the resources and, and information they are putting together. Uh, very powerful group. Uh, as the new guy on the board, so to speak, I really appreciated yesterday to give us some good nuts and bolts going forward and compliment uh, Nathan Oakley and his team for the work they've done to this point. So look forward for some great things to come out of this group uh, in the future. So thank you, ma'am. All right, thank you. A lot of uh, 
despite not being able to see face to face, there's a lot of work going on. So we uh, we appreciate all of the subcommittee reports. We'll move in now to our board items for um, approval and or and our discussion. So um, our first one being. Um, out of the uh, office of the chief academic officer, this is to establish the advanced technical mathematics course. Um, doctor, I start to say, Dr. Oakley, are you there? I am here. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Good morning, Ms. Altman. Good morning, board. Uh, glad to be with you all today and excited to bring forward to you for your consideration an item that is exiting the public comments process. We did not receive any public comments on this course. Uh, but to give you a little bit of context, this is an advanced mathematics course. We're calling it Advanced Technical Math. It's a higher level math course. It's a course that's higher than Algebra 1. And it's designed for students who are CTE completers and students who have also already taken and passed the Algebra 1 state assessment. This course is designed to really give those students a comprehensive picture around real numbers, measurement, data and expressions, equations and functions, um, some introductory trigonometry, as well as geometry and spatial reasoning. Uh, we believe that this course um, will fit nicely in as an as a opportunity for those students to take some of their mathematics skills um, from their CTE uh, programming and apply that and position them for post-secondary opportunities after high school. Be glad to take any questions. Are there any questions about this before we vote on this? All right, do I have a motion uh, to approve uh, this uh, advanced technical mathematics course? Glenn East, go for it, so moved. Okay, and do we have a second? Second, Dr. Angela Bass. Dr. Bass, okay. Um, we do have a motion and a second, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? Dr. Oakley, are you still there? I am still here. I have to ask you, and this has nothing to do with mathematics. Is that a trombone hanging on your wall over there? That, that would be a trombone hanging on my wall. <laughs> I thought, well, I thought, is that a trombone or is that my eyes? Okay, <laughs> that's interesting. All right, uh, item two, our next item is approval of districts of innovation for the 2020, 21-22 school year. Um, we have um, uh, four of those. So the first one will be... Um, Laurel School District. So Dr. Oakley, you take all of these. All right, thank you. We are bringing forward four separate approvals for your consideration this morning. Uh, the first one is a new approval for the Laurel School District. Uh, Laurel has requested to establish a middle college program. This is the program that's being uh, proposed in partnership with Johns College. They've been working on planning for this uh, well over a year now, but this will offer students in Laurel an opportunity to accelerate their completion of dual credit courses uh, while they're in high school. Students will potentially be able to earn up to 60 credit hours of, of uh, college coursework during their time in high school uh, if this is approved. Okay, uh, we need to take take these one at a time um, and vote on them. I think that would be Are, good. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, so this would be, uh, do we have a motion for the <clears throat> approval for uh, the Laurel School uh, to yes. designate? Glenn okay. A. So right. moved. We have a second. Second, Karen Elam. <laughs> okay. We have a motion and second. All in favor of um, granting Laurel as a school of innovation, say aye. 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 Or raise your hand. Okay. Any opposed? All right. The next one is uh, the current school district. Thank you. We're bringing forward for your consideration the renewal of Corinth's application. <sighs> Corinth was designated uh, several years back as a district of innovation, and we're bringing forward a renewal for that district of innovation status. Uh, some of the key aspects of their plan include continued implementation of the Cambridge curriculum, a modified school calendar, uh, some dual credit courses, uh, diversified diploma options, as well as um, some other, other pieces across K-12. Uh, Corinth's been, been pleased to note uh, improved teacher retention rates and improved ACT scores uh, over the last several years. So we bring forward this uh, item for your consideration. Okay. Uh, any questions about current? I, I just, oh, just for, in, just, just for information, how long did these agreements or approvals uh, last in the words? How long ago did current 
get their first approval for a school of innovation? These are these are five year approvals now. And so the ones that we're bringing forward for renewal were initially approved in 2016. Okay, so then this will extend theirs for another five years. This is, in a, yes ma'am, up to five years and this falls under board policy 28.7. There's a policy around district and school of innovation. Okay, thank you. I'll move that we approve um, Corinth for renewal of their agreement. Okay. Ryan McGee. All right, we have a motion second. Just as a reminder, um, when you vote, if you're on mute, unmute yourself so we can hear or else raise your hand so we can see. So uh, all in favor of granting uh, current another um, five years as a district of innovation, say aye. 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 Okay, all, any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. All right, the next one is the Gulfport School District. Thank you. We are bringing forward a renewal request for the District of Innovation status for Gulfport. Uh, Gulfport, some of their highlights over the last five years uh, include almost a doubling of their student inter internships uh, and career opportunities for students, as well as uh, almost 70% of their students who are taking work keys and scoring at a silver or higher. Of those students that took work keys, um, about 70% of those students scored silver or higher. And then Gulfport is also running a middle college program in partnership with Gulf Coast Community College, which is leading to a, a good number of students that are completing uh, their associates while they are in, in high school. All right, before we vote, let the record show that uh, Mr. East is recusing himself from this vote since he is associated with the Gulfport School District. So do we have a motion to approve Gulfport as presented? As presented, Ronnie McGee. Okay. Second, second. Karen Elam. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed? All right. Thank you. And the last one is the Vicksburg Boring School District. Thank you. And I appreciate you taking these one at a time for, for that very reason. Yeah. Uh, we are bringing forward for your uh, approval a request to renew a school of innovation within the Vicksburg Warren School District. Uh, River City Early College High mm -hmm. School. Uh, is a School of Innovation program that's running uh, in Vicksburg Warren. Uh, they've had the majority of their students just this last year, class of 2020, uh, that were first time college going students. Um, and those students that just graduated completed on average more than 50 hours of college credit. So we're, we're pleased with the results we're seeing in that early college program. I would like to recommend continuing that program within the Vicksburg Warren School District. Okay, good, all right, motion to approve. Lynn East, Lynn okay. East, so moved. And a second? Second, Angela Bass. Okay, Mr. East and Dr. Bass, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, good. Thank you, Dr. Oakley, for that. Um, our next one is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the, um, the cat we're discussing or revising the uh, accountability standards, specifically the business rules of the statewide accountability system. And this is regarding the inclusion of the ACT work keys and performance measures. Um, Dr. Vanderford. Thank you, Ms. Altman. Okay. This item is requesting a final approval of the State Board of Education to include the work keys in the college and career readiness component um, with the silver le level um, in conjunction with a recognized industry certification and or the completion of a career pathway, um, the, a score or a gold or platinum would be standalone. There would not be required um, any other, um, there would not be any other requirement in conjunction with the gold or platinum. And um, the, the attached, um, with this item is the APA comments. I think there were about 28 total um, that were received um, during this last APA process. And those are summarized for you in a chart as well as each individual comment behind the, the board item. But the agency's permit uh, position remains that um, we support the board's compromise last month with the silver as a, um, the gold and the platinum is a standalone and the silver in conjunction with the work keys or completion of the industry pathway. Okay, do I have a motion as it relates to this um, 
item on a, regarding ACT work keys? Lynn East, so moved. Okay, is there a second? Second, Karen Elam. Right. Um, any other questions or comments? All well, in uh, favor? I, I'm I, sorry. I have a question. Okay. Uh, Dr. Vanderford, how many of our students um, are in the um, in a school district that has the uh, national certification availability? So I'll have to defer to Dr. Oakley for that. The answer to that question, I think he provided data at the last meeting um, regarding the CTE programs um, throughout his presentation, but I don't recall if he had that specific um, information. I don't have that right in front of me. Um, the, the programs that lead to an industry cert, uh, if they're available within a district, would be available regardless of the district. I, I would point out, um, the, the, I think the, the piece to note here, the language in this proposal does, does mention completer, as, and it also mentions that industry certification, but the, it is not a dual requirement. It, it does not say that a student has to complete at a silver level plus the industry certification as well as completer status. So if a student just earns that completer status, that, that would be sufficient to earn the, uh, the points. And remind me of the definition of a completer status. That's a student who has been through uh, their four course CTE sequence and has completed that uh, CTE pathway. Which is a two year pathway? That is typically a two year pathway, yes sir. And, and this is equitable across the state, is that correct? Based on the data that we have reviewed, we believe that the access is there, the opportunities are there, and that this is in keeping with the, uh, that expectation for college and career readiness in, in line with uh, what we've got right now, yes, sir. If the access is not available, do we have a pathway for those students to achieve that status? So if the access is not available, certainly that consortium model uh, remains an opportunity for districts that are pursuing other opportunities. Well, let, let the record show that, that I am concerned about the, the equity piece uh, for some of our uh, smaller districts across the state. I am in favor uh, of uh, going for the silver level uh, in, in completion. I want to make sure that it's even and the playing field is there. I think, um, Doctor. I, I think obviously the department's going. If the playing field is not level in some districts, uh, although um, you know this consortium model offers that, then that would be up to the department to work with those districts to try to resolve their issues um, with that. Uh, Doctor Bass, do I see you trying to yeah. ask the question? <laughs> I just have a comment. Um, I was reading through the comments and we all also got an email from a group um, that submitted some comments and I just wanted to call them out and emphasize them because I really think they were good recommendations um, if we go forward with um, implementing as proposed. And some of the one, the recommendation is to make sure that we have a robust data system and that we are monitoring and tracking um, the performance on work keys by CTE program. We're keeping up with geographic information and demographic information of the students who are you utilizing that pathway. Um, and we have um, records of districts with anti-discrimination policies in place for CTE placement because I think one of the concerns was, was about tracking students in either career or college. And I think that, you know, the goal of our education system should be to prepare students for options both options when they leave, um, that they'll be able to enter into a career if they want to, or go to college if they decide to go to college, but that they'll be prepared for, for both. And so um, I just wanna make sure that we have a system in place that encourages that. Um, thank you, Dr. Bass. And for the um, board uh, information, the comment that Dr. Bass is re re referring to was a um, comment that was had in strong support of the board's proposal 
um, to include all three levels, two as a standalone. And it did have some very strong recommendations for the agency regarding data collection. And I don't, I know it's on pages 18 to 20 of your backup material. That's at the actual summary of the items is the particular comment that she's referring to. I do not know what page it's on um, with those that are in line, just the emails as they came in. But in the summary document, it is the last one on pages 18 to 20. Thank you, Dr. Vanford. All right, thank you for those comments. We do have a motion and a second on the floor. All in favor of uh, the inclusion of work keys in our accountability system as stated, say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, good. Whew, we have spent a lot of time on work keys, so I feel like this is a major accomplishment. Thank you all for your questions and your comments and, and your support. Uh, the next item is to begin the APA process. Uh, this is to establish the uh, 2021 Mississippi Educator Preparation uh, Provider Process and the guidelines for that. Dr. Vanderpool? So I will, Ms. Altman, um, as Dr. Elam referenced early, turn the uh, portion of the presentation over to Dr. Burson as her office has been responsible. Oh, okay. Yeah. The, the edits Dr. Dr. Burson. Today, yeah. After Dr. Burson um, reviewed the board agenda and the length of the board agenda, she has drastically reduced the presentation <laughs> that she had for the board today. So I know that um, the board will, will appreciate that. Okay. Dr. Burson, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vandiford. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, uh, Dr. Wright, and board members. It is my pleasure to bring to you this morning for your consideration a request to begin the Administrative Procedures Act call for public comment period for the Educator Preparation Provider Process and Performance Guidelines 2021. And if we, yeah, we're good. If you can just put this in, um, Presentation view, please, Tamala. Awesome. Thank you so much. As we initiate uh, with this APA comment period, we will be initiating the adoption and implementation of new processes and guidelines for our EPPs. And for those of you who may be new to the board, let me share EPPs are those who prepare our teachers and leaders. This includes our universities, our colleges, and other entities such as Teach for America, Teach Mississippi Institute, the American Board for the Certification of Teacher Excellence. My name is Debbie Burson and I serve the state as the Bureau Director for Educator Preparation. I began serving the state in 2017 upon my departure from Millsaps College where I served as a professor and department chair. My staff and I serve in the Office of Teaching and Leading, which includes the divisions of Talent Acquisition, Licensure, Educator Preparation, and educator, educator Effectiveness, and Educator Misconduct. Specifically, our work in Educator Preparation is to serve as the gatekeeper for the licenses issued by the Mississippi Department of Education and to ensure all programs that we license have met state and national standards and are aligned to the needs of our P-12 schools. With that, the purpose of this presentation is to bring your attention to the urgency to update and codify guidance for those who prepare teachers and leaders for our schools. And so in these first two slides, um, you're going to see um, very familiar uh, language. But rather than hurriedly skim through, I'd like to take a moment just to unpack the significance of our request today in relation to our vision, mission, and goals. I love our mission, and I can't imagine that anyone wouldn't, to create a world-class educational system that gives students the knowledge and skills to be successful in college, and as Dr. Bass just said, the workforce, and to flourish as parents and citizens. We aim to do both. And so how do we reach this vision? Let's consider our mission to provide leadership through the development of policy and accountability systems so that all students are prepared to compete in the global community. Notice that I've highlighted development of policy and accountability systems because this is a big part of accomplishing our mission. 
the EPP process and performance guidelines are established to ensure strong preparation that will lead to day one ready teachers and leaders. Next slide, please. And here we have our state board goals. This board has set forth six lofty goals to help us achieve our mission. I have starred goal four because this is the work of the Office of Teaching and Leading. However, this goal is also starred because I like to think of it as our North Star. Because if we look at goal one, and if we are going to have all students proficient and showing growth in all assessed areas, we must ensure effective teachers and leaders for all students. And to ensure that every student graduates high school, um, from high school and is ready for college and career, we must ensure that every student has effective teachers and leaders. And to ensure that every child has access to high quality childhood programs, those programs are operated by effective teachers and leaders. And then finally, goal six, every school district is rated C or higher. That, will, that is going to be a result of every effective teacher and leader that we have in our state. So again, I cannot emphasize enough how important goal four is to the work that we do at the agency. Remember that teacher and leader efficacy begins with strong preparation. Next slide, please. So the purpose, the purpose of these guidelines is to provide guidance on the processes and standards necessary for earning and maintaining approval of all programs that lead to licensure. The 2021 Mississippi Educator Preparation Provider Process and Performance Guidelines shall replace the 2006 Administrative Process and Performance Review, which is currently listed as Mississippi Administrative Code Title VII, Part 107. Next slide, please. As just shared, currently listed in Mississippi's Administrative Code are the guidelines from 2006. However, we are fortunate that we maintain a strong collaborative working relationship with our EPPs and IHL. Therefore, through the years, processes have been updated, as was in the case in 2012 when the state redesigned the review process in collaboration with EPPs. However, that was not officially codified. As mentioned earlier, I began my tenure at the agency in 2017. And when asked by a dean about new guidelines becoming effective, my response was, oh, I'll probably have that done by December. Now, little did I know the amount of work involved and the amount of shareholder input and collaboration that is required to accomplish a task such as this. In 2018, we brought forth guidelines to the licensure commission for their approval. The 2018 guidelines included elements related to early literacy coursework and educator prep provider faculty development. These two items unfortunately met with a great deal of pushback from our EPPs. As a result, the licensure commission tabled a decision and requested further development and collaboration with EPPs. We continue to work with EPPs and our MDE academic program offices to strengthen our processes for program review and approval. In January, we brought an updated version of the guidelines to the licensure commission and it was approved. The 2021 version does not include the literacy requirements that were in the 2018 document. And the reason being is that the MDE is currently working with the American Institutes of Research Region 7 Comprehensive Center to develop a new state literacy plan. And upon the completion of a new literacy plan, we foresee new implications for educator prep. Therefore, additional literacy guidelines will be addressed in future updates to these guidelines. I want to also mention that although the Licensure Commission approved these guidelines in January, EPPs did have some significant feedback. So during the months of February and March, we hosted and attended meetings with EPPs and IHL leadership to listen to these concerns. 
We took all feedback and compiled it into one document and addressed. Those comments and responses were included in your backup material for your review in advance of this meeting. As a result of the feedback, we were able to make some edits to the document. The edited document was included in your backup and is the one that will be disseminated for public comment. Next slide. Now, what, what, what's in the guidelines? What's this all about, right? So now I'd like to just briefly share some of the information that is contained in this 100, almost 120 page document as compared to the 2006 document that was less than 30 pages. The EPPs requested a one-stop shop for guidance related to program review and approval. And we have tried our very best to accomplish that one stop right here in these guidelines. The document consists of eight sections. The first section is just a general overview. The second section um, delves into national and state review processes, giving just general information, timelines, reporting requirements of the national accreditor, as well as federal reporting of Title II. Section three goes into detail regarding the requirements for the state program review. We have worked with APPs to ensure close alignment with the national accreditation standards while maintaining focus on program specificity. This is a deep dive review that is conducted every seven years at the midpoint of an EPP's national accreditation cycle. We piloted this program review 2.0 with seven EPPs during the fall of 2019. This formative review process was conducted electronically. This section of the guidelines includes an overview of the re review process, defines recommendations, which include recommendation of state approval, recommendation of state approval with conditions, and recommendation of not approved further development required. Program review recommendations will be brought to the licensure commission upon an EPP's conclusion of their national accreditation cycle. This section also includes guidance on annual reporting and a new student teacher report, which is done each semester. The student teaching report collects demographic data on placements, candidates, university supervisors, and cooperating teachers. We collect email information in order to disseminate satisfaction surveys that are sent each semester. Section four is our new program approvals and modification sections. Twice a year, our EPPs have the opportunity to present new program requests and modifications to existing programs to the licensure commission. This review process allows us to ensure that the new programs developed by the EPPs meet the state's needs and that modifications to existing programs are also in alignment with our state's needs. Section five in this document has been left blank and it is a placeholder for alternate route programs. We are beginning the process of redesigning alternate route preparation. Our first shareholder work group meeting <coughs> will be held in May. Section six is on curriculum. It goes into deep dive of details on state requirements as related to student teaching, content knowledge, admission, exit requirements, et cetera. And section seven is glossary. Section eight is a very extensive appendices section in which we include all the forms, the rubrics, um, anything that the EPP may need to stay in compliance with the state can be found in the appendices section. So in closing, let me tell you what a great pleasure it is to serve the state in this capacity. They say, if you love what you do, you will never work a day in your life. Leading the state's effort. I'll get emotional because I love this my passion project. <laughs> Leading the state's effort to ensure strong preparation for teachers. is my passion. And I appreciate the opportunity to serve. <laughs> Thank you very much. And we, uh, Dr. Vanderford, do you have anything else you want to add to that? Or is uh, no, ma'am? I just okay. appreciate Dr. Burson's leadership as well as um, Dr. Murphy's and all the other staff in teaching and leading, and particularly the stakeholder engagement that we've had across the state with the EPP yeah. and all of the other stakeholders. So it's been an effort. 
that's taken everyone across the state yeah. of Mississippi. <laughs> Well, it's obvious a lot of work has gone into it. Um, we have item number four. We need approval to begin this APA um, process. So do we have a motion? Do you, does anyone else have any questions before we move forward? No questions, Rose. Maybe from a, from okay. a practitioner stance as a superintendent, let me say this is great work that has, has long been needed. So thank you very much to Debbie, her team, and everybody for putting this together. Let's move forward with some very good ideas. Thank you, guys. Good. Okay, thank you. Uh, so do we have a motion to approve uh, this item? So moved. So moved. Okay. Dr. Dr. McGee and, uh, has the motion, and Dr. Elam has the second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, any opposed? Great, thank you very much. We appreciate that and we're glad to move forward on it. Number five, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, number five is to establish deadlines. This is our, our related to our waivers. Um, this is established deadlines related to the suspension of strict compliance with state statutes uh, and related to Governor Reeves' pro proclamation of a state of emergency as related to the impact of COVID-19. And Dr. Vanford, I'm going to uh, let you handle this. Um, this is the chart that appears to have been, uh, I'm sorry, this is the chart that appears to have been a standing item since March of 20 yeah. when um, we began uh, our journey with COVID, uh, but what this item today before you for approval is um, to capture all of the waivers, the rule suspensions, the deadline extensions, et cetera, that have been granted since March of 2020. Um, and as in keeping with our former practice, um, the red font in your backup material is the language that is new. All that is in black font has been previously approved. The only new addition that we have this month, um, with the exception of the guidelines that have been entered, is the with standard four, the Office of Management and Budget, um, our OBM, has authorized a, another extension for submission of the deadline for the um, FY 2020 audits. And that has been um, delayed for another time period and that is indicated in standard four. So we just wanted to have an item before the board to ensure with complete transparency um, for school districts and the administration that's moving forward with establishing their schedules and their plans for the upcoming school year that the waivers that have been granted for either the 1920 school year or the 2021 school year all have end dates. They're, I'm not gonna walk through every standard, but there may be an exception, like the MCOPS grant under school safety, for an example, that deadline is December the 31st of 2020, but that is still associated with the 2021 school year and the time frame that the SROs have to receive the training that should have been um, completed within the 2021 school year. And then many of the items, um, indicate with the conclusion of the 2021 school year, because we will have grades reported through summer school, extended school year, credit recovery, um, et cetera. But again, this is just um, asking the board to approve these established um, deadlines so that it's clear and concise and districts know what we're looking for moving forward into the 21-22 the school year. And um, we, I've received a lot of questions regarding assessment and accountability um, for the upcoming school year. And this is as of today, it includes all the waivers that we've been granted by USED. We have no way to predict if there will even be any waivers of any sort um, regarding assessment or accountability and reporting for the upcoming school year. But if it is, we will bring that back to the board um, at a later date, but this is, as of today, the plans to move forward under um, for the 2021 school year, following all federal guidelines, um, state law, state board policies, and accreditation standards that that we have in place. All right, thank you. Um, you know, this is uh, 
technically uh, opening school again uh, and going full board this next year to have school. And that that's our goal is to get uh, students back in the classroom and get some point of normalcy back to uh, our everyday life. So uh, any comments or questions about this? Um, I have a question. Dr. Oh, Bannerford, uh, have we communicated with our school districts uh, about definitions for the 21-22 school year in regards <coughs> to virtual and the amount of time uh, and that credit awarding? A number of, of guys are, are asking questions about, you know, they're planning now, and so they want the department to basically uh, share information regarding all that. So we have clearly communicated to districts that for the upcoming school year, we will resume a 180 day school calendar. We will resume the 330 minutes per day of instruction that's required in state law, as well as the time required for earning a Carnegie unit credit. We are currently working collaboratively internally and we are scheduling a stakeholder engagement group um, that will provide additional guidance um, or establish a board policy that further um, provides a further guidance than what we had this previous school year with the establishment of um, the attendance policy. So um, our intent is for districts to have the option to move forward with virtual learning on a case-by-case -case basis or um, district-wide in case of weather, et cetera. But we're fleshing all of that out and plan to have that back to the board no later than the June meeting for the board's approval. I, I, go ahead. Yeah, I, I really strongly uh, uh, suggest that we have conversations with some of our districts that struggle with the virtual delivery and, and how can we assist them in moving forward for the next school year. Uh, this is vital information uh, that educators and principals need, you know, as, as they exit this year going to next year. So uh, please put that at the top of the list. That, that's where it is. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do you, we have a motion as related to uh, this item regarding waivers and uh, motion. establishing? Motion. I'm sorry. Okay. Dr. McGee, do we have a second? Second. Second. Okay, Dr. Bass, uh, all in favor? Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, item six is uh, the appointment or the approval of a financial advisor for the Holmes County Consolidated School District. Um, Dr. Gavin? Yes, good morning, board. Okay. <laughs> Yes, uh, board members, you all received a letter. This item is in reference to the letter that you received from the Office of the State Auditor. And the letter just stated that the Holmes County Consolidated School District was issued a disclaimer of opinion from their public accountant, from their public auditor. So as a result of that, um, the State Board of Education is required to appoint a financial advisor to Holmes County School District and so this is what this item is doing. It's bringing forth to you approval to appoint a financial advisor for the Holmes County Consolidated School District. Okay. Do we have a motion to, uh, so that they can move forward with this action? Any so moved. And a second? Second, Karen Elam. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Any opposed to this? All right. Uh, item seven is approval of the methodology to award grant dollars for behavior telehealth to schools in accordance with elementary and secondary emergency um, relief fund. Um, is Dr. Cole here? Uh, yes, I'm here. Oh, hey. Good morning. Hey. Uh, good morning, board. Uh, this is one of the most exciting items on the agenda, if you ask me this morning. Uh, <laughs> Uh, once again, we'd like to request approval to uh, award grant dollars for behavioral telehealth to schools in accordance with the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund. Uh, the purpose of this is to uh, provide an ecosystem for behavioral health delivery within the school setting that provides mental and behavioral health care to children and increase educator knowledge 
uh, around mental health and behavioral health care. Uh, additionally, it will provide support to improve access for mental health services by providing mental health behavior appointments for uh, students due to COVID and the COVID-19 in this pandemic. Uh, we view this as a tremendous game changer in our toolkit for education here in the state, and we seek approval of it. And Dr. Right, Go ahead. I'm sorry, um, Ms. Altman, and if I may say something, Dr. Cole, Please. this item is actually the um, the methodology for that particular grant, and we mm -hmm. had to pull that item out uh, above the actual issuance of the approval of the grant, which you will see later on in one of the other agenda items, but this item is actually the approval mm -hmm. of the methodology, and you'll see the actual award later on in the agenda. Okay, good. Thank you. And this, this goes along with uh, part of Amy's uh, presentation this morning also. So that's a, a good interface. Um, do we have any questions about this? Do we have a motion to approve uh, this request, to approve this methodology? Lenny, do we summon. have a motion? Okay, <laughs> do we have a second? Second, Angela Bass. Okay. Uh, Mr. East and Dr. Bass, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. All right. Any opposed? Thank you, Dr. Coe. Well, uh, item eight is approval of a number of, of uh, contracts with the department. Uh, the first one being uh, renewing a contract with Research and Curriculum Unit. This is um, uh, the operation of the Mississippi Career and Planning Assessment System. Uh, Dr. Oakley, any comments on that? This is a, just an annual renewal for the administration right. of our statewide assessment. So nothing, nothing more from my end. Okay. Uh, the next one with uh, uh, Lydia Boutwell, early childhood coach. Is any nothing? I mean, that's a, not anything unusual on that. No, ma'am. This is a renewal, but most of the next few items, they're all renewals. This right, they're all renewals. Um, these are items A through uh, A, H, I, J, through J. Uh, anybody have any questions on any of those or any clarification that you need either through um, Dr. Gavin or um, Dr. Oakley, Dr. Cole, any of them? Any questions on those? We'll take them all as one action. If you um, have questions, we'll pull it out. So I'll move, Madam Chairman. Okay. Um, Mr. East, it's moved for approval of items A uh, through 8A through 8J. Uh, we have a motion. Do we have a second relating to this? Back back, Karen Elam. Okay. Uh, any other questions on it? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Okay, item nine is also several items. Um, these are grants um, that um, are uh, being awarded. Uh, the first one, uh, Dr. Oakley, anything that we need to pull out on these? The first two are yours? Nothing from my end, no ma'am. Okay. And Dr. Gavin, um, school nurse program? Uh, nothing, no ma'am. Nothing, okay. And then Dr. Cole, this relates to, uh, item E relates to the methodology we just approved. So um, we have items A, uh, 9A through E. Um, do we have a motion to approve those? I move. Okay, okay, Dr. Bass, and do we have a second? Second, Karen Elam. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, any opposed? Good, thank you. The next items are our consent agenda items. Uh, no one requested any particular one being um, pulled out for a discussion. So under the consent agenda, items A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and I, do we have uh, a motion to approve the items on the consent agenda? Lynn A, so moved. Okay, is there a second? Second, Angela Bass. 
Okay. We have a motion and a second. All in favor of the consent agenda? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. I'll be so glad when we can get back together and, and look at each other when we're doing this. And, and hopefully in May, I, it was a surprise to me back when I discovered that uh, the department is not, doesn't have control of their building. So uh, it's it's uh, made it a little difficult. So, uh, but hopefully they'll get through with all the renovations and we can get back. Uh, we do need a very quick executive session uh, to take care of a couple of matters. So um, I will um, entertain a determination for the need of going into executive session. Uh, Madam Chairman, uh, Lynn East, I move that the board consider making a closed determination of the need to go into executive session. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, we'll pause just a minute and let them shut down the light. Let her know. Live feed is back on. Thank you. The board has moved to go into executive session for the following purposes in accordance with Mississippi Code annotated section 254174A and K. They have moved to go into executive session to discuss discrete personnel matters related to the approval of appointments to certain positions within the Department of Education.
Okay, we're live. All right, thank you. Uh, the board has exited, exited the executive session and we um, took two items under consideration and approved them. The first one was the appointment um, of uh, an Educator Bureau Director 2 to serve in the role of Compliance Officer with the uh, Chief Operations Officers Office. Uh, Kimberly Wiggins was appointed to that position. And uh, then the second one was the appointment of an Associate State Superintendent to serve in the role of Academic Liaison with the Chief Academic Office. And that uh, candidate is Dr. Marla Davis. Both of these were approved and we look forward to having them and working with them. Uh, the, um, um, are there any, um, does anyone need approval to attend any meetings or um, anything out of state? All right, hearing none. The next meeting of the board will be held on May 20th, 21 at the Central High School building. And that is certainly our hope uh, beginning at 10 a.m. So we appreciate your participation. And uh, if you have no other uh, items or for information or business, we'll stand adjourned if you, uh, do, or I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, no move. Unless y'all want to just keep on meeting and talking. <laughs> so Dr. McGee, do we, and do we have a second. Second. All right. Dr. Elam. Elam. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate your participation and y'all have a good week. We need, Thank we you. need a vote. I'm sorry. We need a vote. We got a motion oh, and a second. I know. <laughs> you know, I'm used to just adjourning meetings and getting up and leaving. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a motion and a second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay. All right. Then we are officially adjourned. <laughs>